Welcome once again to a special bonus episode of The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And today our guest is Daniel Heath Justice. Daniel is a Colorado-born citizen of the Cherokee Nation. He's professor of critical indigenous studies and English at the University of British Columbia. His published work is largely in the area of indigenous literary studies, indigenous studies, and animal cultural history, including the recent Why Indigenous Literatures Matter, which came out in 2018, and Raccoon, which is just out. He also, with co-editor Jean M. O'Brien, who's White Earth Ojibwe, written the forthcoming Allotment Stories, Indigenous Land Relations Under Settler Siege. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's really exciting to have you. It's been so long since I've gotten a chance to talk with you. This is very exciting. <laughs> oh, and thank you. first off, congratulations on the new book. Thank you. Suzanne and I both have copies of it, and it looks delightful. It is lavishly illustrated with all sorts of, I mean, not all of the pictures of raccoons are cute. Some of them are, you know, there's some darker <laughs> sides to the story, yes. but but quite a lot of delightful pictures in it, as well as very good writing. <laughs> They're totally encyclopedic, these books. And as somebody who loves encyclopedism and encyclopedias, this really drew me in um, and left me with a lot of questions and curiosity about ways to go forward from this work. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I, I'm a huge fan of the series. So it's been a real delight to be able to now have two books in the series and authors are responsible for the imagery. So it's nice to know that the pictures are are connecting with readers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the books came out at different moments in the history of the series too. Um, Badger had come out back in 2015, if I remember correctly, and then Raccoon just now. And it was interesting to to read both of these and to think about What's the common ground? What's different? And how do they fit into that larger series in different ways? In other words, how is thinking about animal nature shifting, whether for you as an individual author or like more broadly in the ways in which we talk about them? Yeah, you know, when I was working on badger, um, badgers are my beast. I mean, if, if I still, if I had to choose one of the two, although raccoons are very close, um, but badgers, I just have a very very deep attachment to to badgers. You bring that out in the book in ways that were very moving, I thought. Yeah, well, I'm glad they were moving and not not disturbing because I have I <laughs> I think a lot of people are like you're a little you're a little too excited about this whole badger thing. You're a little fixated. <laughs> well, no, both of those things. Like you bring out you know the early reading that made you feel things for badgers, but then you also tell stories that are quite disturbing, like the one you talk about um, the the incident of encountering a badger that had been killed on the road and how you dealt with that. So disturbing in a good way. In other words, it wasn't an easy or pretty story. And I really valued that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think for, for me, I felt the need to be very comprehensive in the Badger book in ways I didn't feel with Raccoon. I mean, badgers are still underrepresented uh, to my mind in the animal literature, but raccoons are not. Raccoons are, are quite prominent in some ways. Um, and they're just there was no way I could do a comprehensive study of raccoons. And so I, I didn't feel the same kind of pressure on myself. And I also had just a better sense of these books also being stories. They're not just studies, but they're stories about these animals and their own sense worlds, but also how they inhabit our imaginations. And I felt better prepared to tell the the raccoon story, having done the the badger one. Um, and in some ways, I think it's a better read. Uh, I think it flows better. I just I I knew more about what I wanted to do, and I felt a little bit more freedom with the raccoon. And you'd done that kind of book, right? So you knew how to do it, right? Even though you did it somewhat differently. Yeah, yeah. I, well, and it was it was surprising that you know I knew how to do it, but it was like learning all over again because it was such a different animal, and the archive is so different, and this a lot of the sources I was drawing on were just very different in that way too. So it was familiar, but it was also a little uncanny in that way. Well, let's start at maybe the beginning, perhaps. I, you know, was the badger the first animal that you got really interested in, or have you always been really devoted to animals or really curious about animals? Yeah, I've always been an animal person. Um, I grew up in a rural area in Colorado, um, and animals, wild animals, were always just kind of a fundamental part of my life. Um, always had dogs in the house. Was really fascinated by by weird animals, right? And and it was burrowing animals that started it. Um, I was a huge fan of Wind in the Willows. I loved badger. I loved mole. And 
you know, I grew up in a mining town, and so a lot of that made sense. But animals were always really important to me from my earliest days. I also, I didn't have a lot of friends. I was kind of a strange child uh, to the kids I grew up with. I was, you know, I was very much a, a dreamer and nerdy, and those were not things that a lot of kids in my little town felt a great affinity for. Um, but animals didn't judge you. And, you know, in my imaginative world, you could have very rich and informative conversations with these with these creatures. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've always loved animals um, and always had a deep respect for them. I grew up in a hunting family as well. Um, and my family's Oklahoma Cherokee, but I wasn't raised with any kind of ceremonial traditions. But my dad was a hunter and an outdoorsman, but had a very different respect for the wild world than a lot of our neighbors did. Um, and not only for the, the beauty and the, the vulnerability of the wild, um, but also the danger of the wild. Um, you know, there was never a romanticism about the way we lived um, and what we had to do, but there also wasn't a, any desire to create more of a burden than was necessary with our activities in the woods. So I've always really appreciated that. Um, I ended up being a little bit more of an environmentalist than either of my folks anticipated, but that really does come from my upbringing and particularly from my dad. That emerges a tiny little bit in uh, in an unexpected way. I remember it's in the notes to the epilogue of Badger. It, you tell a little anecdote that's about your dad. You said, my dad recalls having killed two badgers with a rat-tailed file when he was a boy living on his family's ranch in eastern Colorado in the 1930s. He did this in part just to see if he could. Fortunately, he softened considerably toward the animal world in the ensuing years. And it, it, it struck me, I remember when I read it, that's why it stuck in my head, because like the story you tell about encountering the badger that had been killed by the side of the road, you're not willing to sort of hide the messy and complicated ways that we connect to animals, you know, that the, the, the untidy dark kind of way we connect to animals. Well, and that's a really important thing for me. And in that work is, you know, it's complicated. Our relationship with the animal world is very complicated. And oftentimes, even our love of these animals endangers them. And I think it's very easy. I think it's especially easy for people who are more urban to romanticize or vilify animals, kind of moving to both extremes, whereas most of our relationships are more complicated than that. And most of our relationships have a pretty negative impact on animals, even when we think that we're, we're doing something good. Um, and that was always a story that the, about the file that really troubled me, because my dad... He didn't like animals being in pain. He didn't like animal suffering. So, you know, my dad's a phenotypically native man who's a hunter and was kind of known as the Indian of my hometown. And yet, when he would go hunting, he hated bow hunting, just hated it. And I was kind of like, Dad, you're an Indian. You're supposed to like bows and arrows when I was a kid. And he said, no, a rifle, you kill them mm -hmm. with a bow you're going to injure them, and then we have to track them. They're bleeding. They're in pain. And so that was an early sign for me that, you know, the stereotypes about indigeneity were not about indigeneity at all. They were about other people's ideas about who we were. And, yeah, he, he hated bows and arrows. He also hated automatic weapons because the only thing those were good for was killing people. And so, again, those complexities. Uh, but he, he was not about harm. And so he would tell this story about being a kid where, you know, he just killed these animals to kill them. And yet we would also go out um, and he'd bring his twenty two rifle and he'd go shoot prairie dogs on our neighbor's pastures. He'd never shoot the badgers, uh, but he'd shoot the prairie dogs because he didn't want our friend's cattle to get crippled by the prairie dog holes. So it was very complicated. There was just, there was no way to say he had changed completely, but it was it was complicated. It was a non-romantic way of thinking about animals, understanding them as autonomous and worthy of respect in certain kinds of ways. Um, you use the language of people when you talk about whether animals, when you talk about badgers or raccoons or foxes or bears. Like, for example, there's a, a beautiful passage, this is toward the end of Badger, where you say badgers are an ancient people older in the forms they possess than we are. They speak to the dark mysteries of our own evolutionary past and inhabit strange and secret worlds. 
Um, and it goes on. It's a beautiful passage. And along with encountering language similar to that in other places, like that distinguishes between two-legged people and four-legged people, um, that was a way of thinking that was very new to me at one point. But as I become more accustomed to it, 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 it feels uh, there's a lot that flows from that way of thinking. I was really struck by that in your books. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's, that is the teachings that we have in my dad's lineage, right? I mean, this is the you know, traditional Cherokee people think this way about animals um, and, you know, and other indigenous people as well. I mean, we're, we're not the only people in the world. We are, we are one of many people. Um, and I think once you start to think of the world as myriad peoples rather than, you know, hierarchies of significance where only some beings are people, I think it changes your your sense of exceptionalism, species exceptionalism, but I think it also humbles you in important ways. One of the things I was really struck by in Raccoon and in Badger both is that there's a, there's a lot of interesting common ground in these two books, and then there's some real distinctions. And one of the big distinctions that I think relates in interesting ways to what we've been talking about with regard to people, whether it's two-legged or four-legged people, is the ways in which we talk about badgers. Um, you, you make it clear that you know there's European badgers, there's badgers of the Americas, there's the African honey badger, there's there's a number of different ways and different parts of the world to associate the, the badger with. But for the raccoon, that setting in the Americas, and particularly the ways in which the terms for the raccoon come into European languages, it, 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 it was really interesting how different that grounding was and the implications that flowed out of that. And I don't know if I can put this really well, because it's, it's something that I kind of understood without putting it into words. When we talk about people, right, we might not make a distinction between human beings and animals, right? We understand them as people. But um, we might also understand human beings and different kinds of animals as also being kin in certain kinds of ways. That is, depending on how a certain people understands their affiliation with a particular animal, whether it's um, in clan structures or other kinds of ways. In other words, and, and I only dimly have a sense of this, it seems like there's kinship relations that cut across what, um, from a Eurocentric perspective would be species lines. Am, am I wrong about this to sense this difference? No, not at all. I mean, that's exactly the case. Um, and, you know, it, it, of course, it's always going to vary uh, depending on the nation. But the category of person, in addition to being kind of a, an amorphous one and an, and an adaptive one, it's not limited to biology either. Um, and the category of human isn't either. I mean, in so many of our traditions, humans um, emerged from other animals um, or other animals came from us. So there's an old Cherokee story that bears were actually humans who had gone feral. Um, and so for, for some Cherokees are still seen as a very near relative because they are still humans, but they're just shaggy, hairy humans who kind of went wild. And, you know, there are other other nations, you know, even in Cherokee Nation, the first woman is corn, uh, Selu. So we're actually descended from the first hunter and our progenitor, corn. And that's not a difficult truth to hold, right? Like that's not a, a difficult thing to understand because, you know, you can think about it very metaphorically. You can think of it quite literally. Uh, you can also just think about it in terms of, you know, all bipedal life is connected to other life, you know, in significant ways. Um, we're not that different from other creatures um, in in really fundamental ways. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think... The more we start looking into the long relationships that humans have had with animals, the more we see the bleed of categories uh, being a constant feature. Um, and the attempts to reify boundaries coming into place, um, especially with monotheism, uh, to kind of create a hierarchy of significance between other than human animals and humans to kind of highlight our own supposed supremacy there. I want to take these ideas about this blurring and pull them back to something you were talking about earlier, which is your childhood experiences of seeing the animals, the burrowing animals, as a reasonable alternative to the human children friends that you could have had. And that, you know, you engage with them seemingly on a very similar or even perhaps more profound level than you were able to engage with the 
normie kids in the neighborhood, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested in that because also, you know, we just did an episode on Charlotte's Web. And oh, yes. <laughs> we're thinking about the ways animals play out in children's literature and how they can, I'm going to say stand in for people, but I don't quite mean that. But I mean that how they function as people and as not quite people or as people with a slightly different characteristic to them, maybe for some children. You know, it, it, it means something different when you have an animal in a story die than if you had a human in that story die, perhaps. I mean, this is my sense of it. I could be wrong. But it both can mean a lot more and also be easier to handle for a child, is my suspicion. You know, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I think also there is there's a lack of deception in a lot of these animals. You know, because the world you inhabit as a child is filled with all of these unwritten rules um, and unanticipated violences. You know, you have these arbitrary authorities all around you. They're all giants. Um, and they say one thing and do something different, but you're held to the, to the standard that they say and not do. And animals are pretty direct about what they want and what they don't want. You know, you know that if you pull the dog's tail, it's going to bite you. You learn that pretty quickly anyways. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and there's no there's no guile there. Um, and even animals called sneaky, you know, they're pretty straightforward. They, you know what they want, and, and you may be surprised from time to time, but it's not because they were deceptive. You just, you know that you just didn't read something right. And so I think for me as a child, there was just, like, you knew what the rules were. Um, and, you know, the animals that I always connected with were kind of rule-bound creatures, like Badger from Wind of the Willows. Like, he is tradition. He is rules. There's no question there. Um, I didn't like Toad. Toad was very unpredictable. He was very discourteous, and he was dangerous. Uh, he was chaotic. Um, but I think we, we, as children, we live in a world where there's it's, it's so much is arbitrary, but not so much of the animal world is. That's really interesting. I think you're onto something. I'm, I'm thinking about what that means in terms of animal or animal characters in literature, being able to have that moment of revelation, right? That, that some unexpected side of the animal's personality can reveal itself after long familiarity, the way that you might find with humans. You know, you see your friend in a new light, not necessarily a negative light, but you see some other side of them when they're put into this other situation. Like, that seems like a common trope of developing a character in a fiction piece. Do animals allow that as much? Hmm. I, you know, I don't know. I'm thinking back to Charlotte's Web, um, you know, which was one of my very favorite books as a child as well. And we don't really see a lot of transformation, except with a character like Templeton, right? Like, Templeton... He's so self-absorbed, <laughs> but he's he's not heartless. But you don't ever imagine that he's benevolent, right? Like no. you, you don't ever. But he's not. He's he is who he is. You 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 know what you're getting when you get Templeton, right? And the mystery of Charlotte is our own prejudice against spiders. Charlotte's very straightforward about who she is and her motivations, and and like when when Wilbur is so horrified at her killing a fly, she's a little bit bewildered by his horror. I mean, she, she's just, you know, this is what I do. This is, this is how I survive. But it's, it's very straightforward. And I think the, the animal stories that endure are the ones that capture that and capture that with real respect for the distinctiveness of animals and not trying to make them into humans with you know, little humans with, with fur coats, but to, that they, they maintain some sort of otherness, um, kind of a sovereign otherness about them. Um, and, you know, the ones that don't endure don't do that. They just kind of reduce everything to just, you know, fuzzy people in tweed or something. <laughs> I think there's also a moment when Charlotte describes injecting the flies with something to numb the pain. Wilbur is relieved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. But, that, right. but that sort of reminds me of your story of your father thinking about, you know, you use the gun on the animal because it will, there's no need to have them suffer. Yeah. And then there's that similar consideration. Well, and that's part of her consideration for Wilbur, right? Like she does not want him to suffer. And and there's kind of a 
there's a senselessness in his death for her. Um, it's not just that they become friends, but um, his death isn't needed. There's, there's more significance for him beyond death. And, and he doesn't want to die. I mean, that's the thing that she responds to. You know, he's he's crying out about this. He's just discovered what his fate is, right? And um, and she's like, "Well, that's not going to happen." Yeah. And, and he's like, "Well, it, how?" And she's like, "I'm going. I will not let it happen." Yeah. Um, and so it's a it's a deeply empathetic intervention. It is, yeah, and and it's a, it's a beautiful book. Um, and the, you know, the original cartoon I also loved very much. Were most of your childhood favorite books animal stories? No, um, I did like them a lot. Uh, the other two book series that really connected, I mean, The Hobbit was always my very favorite book. Um, but we could talk more about the animals in that because I have some thoughts on that. Um, and and uh, L. Frank Baum's Oz series, the 14 oh, books, too. which oh. of course you have the animals, right? But those would probably be Wind in the Willows, Charlotte's Web, The Hobbit, and the Baum books uh, would probably all be things that would have really kind of had an indelible mark on my imagination as a child. So a few episodes ago, we did The Fellowship of the Ring, obviously the first book in that trilogy. And of course, the best character in, in the book is Bill the Horse. <laughs> 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 so you say. That's awesome. That's awesome. I wouldn't necessarily agree, but he is an awesome character. Yes. No, it's not. It's true. He is. He, what I mean is that he's the one that I became unduly invested in. And like yes, when I yeah. finally got to the end of the trilogy and was like, oh, oh, he's fine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tolkien, for letting me know that the horse, you know, was fine. <laughs> he made it home. It's all good. He's now happy. It's all, it's all yeah. great. <laughs> but I, I, I got really fascinated by the way that like having that horse there, having that horse is you don't really get like a point of view scene from the horse, but you definitely get a chance to understand in that scene where they're trying to open the doors into, into Moria that like the alienness of it all, I think is best understood from this horse who cannot understand what's going on at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the bond between him and Sam and Sam's absolute horror at the idea that they're going to let him go. Exactly. Losing, losing Bill is worse for Sam than losing Gandalf. It is absolutely. And, and, He's almost willing to let let Frodo go on without him. Like, he's that close, right? Um, and so what they're actually making him do is choose between these two beings that he's devoted to. That's right. And th it's actually a really interesting moment for him because it's, it's where the gravity of what they're undertaking comes home to him is when he has to give Bill up. That's the first choice he has to make. And it mirrors the choice when he thinks Frodo's dead and takes the ring. It prepares him for that moment. It also, I mean, it also does a tremendous amount of work, at least for me, in making Sam really compelling, right? Like, yeah. he's been around for a while, and it's not like I didn't enjoy him, but that is a scene where I was like, okay, Sam is great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I think it also shows Tolkien's love of animals. Um, like, he had a real care for animals. And I wish, I so wish the Jackson films would have captured some of the complexity of the animals in Tolkien's world. Um, that's, um, there's much that I love about those movies, but I think that's one of the huge failures, is they become so human-centric, which is so not what the books were, especially The Hobbit. And it's an incredibly important point because one of the things that people respond to in the movies as well as in the books is this idea of different races. This is Tolkien's term of, of, of people, right? And so in the world of the books, that's a very complex set of ideas that has to do with uh, ants and orcs and elves and men and hobbits and animals as well, I think. But in the movies, that gets flattened out in a, in a particular kind of way. It completely does. You know, and you have eagles who in The Hobbit, they speak. They have a voice. Uh, the wargs have voices. And the mieras. Absolutely. All of these different creatures have voices and personalities and perspectives. Um, and the, these completely get erased. I mean, the only animals in the movies that have voice are the spiders. And that's only when Bilbo's wearing the ring. But in the book, they, they all have voices and they all have different motivations, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is a Tolkien podcast on the network that we're on called By the Bywater. And their next episode they've just announced is going to be all about the eagles. 
Hmm. And I'm super curious what they'll have to say about it. Absolutely. And, you know, we mentioned uh, the Wizard of Oz books. I've read the first one. I haven't gone any further than that. And except for Toto, I can't really remember too many animals in that book. Are there animals that play interesting roles later on in the series? I know the series goes on for millions of books. Oh, all, all the books have animals. Um, you have, well, don't forget the Cowardly Lion. Oh, you're right. Of course. I see. Now I think of, you know, I just imagined Bert Lahr, but no, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's an actual lion in the, in the yeah. book. And the hungry tiger and the glass cat and the woozy. And like, it's just, it's filled with animals and constructs. Well, all kinds of people, right? Like, yep. Right. And some of them are born in the usual biological kind of way and others come into being through magical means, right? Yep. And then the humans are called meat people, which I've always loved that yes. terminology. <laughs> yes. Because uh, that, that's how the Scarecrow and Tin Woodman refer to them is as meat people. That's right. Um, which is kind of grim. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it, it makes sense, right? Like, <laughs> but there's, there's all these other kinds of like, again, in between kinds of people, right? So, for example, Polychrome, the rainbow's daughter, right? She eats, but she only eats a few drops of dew. Right. So, so that because eating and not eating is the thing that distinguishes meat people from non meat people. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's, again, there's that spectrum of possibility in the Oz books, which is not the same as, but analogous to what we we're describing in Tolkien. And gender is so fascinating as oh, well. So, Ozma. <laughs> Ozma and Button Bright, right? Yes. I mean, you have these characters who, like, Button Bright never has a gender. You don't ever know if this is a boy or a girl. That's right. Um, it, you know, there's a sense that there's only two options. And then Ozma starts as a girl, becomes a boy, and then becomes a girl again. Mm -hmm. um, so gender is, is uh, like, these books are so fascinating. I mean, Baum's antagonism toward Native people is, doesn't endear him to me now. But in terms of these books and their impact on my imagination as a child, I, there was so much that I loved about them. Mm. You know, we were just talking about in-between natures, and uh, one of the things that struck me very much about Badger and Raccoon is that each in their own way seem to be really thinking a lot about this in-between nature issue. So not just in terms of like two-legged or four-legged people, but in a more specific way. So there's this um, beautiful moment, it's at the opening of a chapter where you say, Badgers are creatures of the underworld, chthonic denizens of earth and darkness. And then you talk about their underground dens. And you say, Badgers inhabit a symbolic realm that humans can know only in ceremony and story, a liminal position between the dead and the living, the marvelous and the mundane. And, and you fold that out in all kinds of ways in the book. And I, I found myself thinking about how that was also true in very different kinds of ways um, in, in Raccoon. And I wanted to think about that together a little bit because you, you fold that out in such subtle and interesting ways. Like you point out the qualities of raccoon bodies and raccoon intelligence that human beings recognize as kin in some way without without flattening that out into some kind of you know conventional encyclopedic hierarchy of different kinds of beings right but they're also creatures of the nighttime right and in terms of when they um when they hunt and when they um are out eating or swimming in backyard pools and whatever it is they're doing <laughs> ravaging people's water fountains like and they're in the cities and they're adaptable and um and you bring that out that adaptable nature and the way in which it parallels in some ways human nature and so I wonder uh, is the can you talk more about that in betweenness like either the common ground of in betweenness for the badger and the raccoon or the very different ways in which they're in between yeah no I'd be happy to um I think the in betweenness was more significant for me with raccoon than with badger um. Partly because of the way people reacted to the fact I was working on a book about raccoons. <laughs> um, people tended not to have a middle ground. They tended to either really love them or hate them. But, you know, my research was showing that the in-between was really the realm that raccoons inhabited. You know, biologically, behaviorally, symbolically. And in some ways, it was that in-betweenness that was the cause of the, the binary response, um, that some people wanted them to inhabit a particular role, like either be complete vermin or either be complete uh, delight. And they just refuse. They, they don't behave in ways that 
a lot of humans want them to. Whereas for badgers, I think most people just don't know much about badgers, and most people don't have any interaction with them. And so you have one animal that's very familiar to the point of people misunderstanding it because it's they think they understand it because they've had encounters with it in many cases. And then another animal that people mostly know only through pop culture. And yet for both of them, that middle ground is, is a place of opportunity, but also a, a place of pretty profound danger for them. But in so many ways, the raccoon is just, it's an outlaw. Not naturally, but just based on human, you know, the ways we humans kind of construct ideas. Uh, you know, and not all human societies have that sense of, of raccoons, but in pretty much every context that I've studied and I know about, raccoons inhabit a, a world between. They have features that are very human, their little paws, their behavior, but their eyes are the eyes of an animal and they're inscrutable. Their faces are the eyes of, of an animal. They sit up and look human with these animal faces. Their behavior, they don't run away in the same ways that other animals do from us. Um, they're drawn to novelty rather than repelled by it. Um, so in all of these different ways, they sit between categories of comfort for us. Um, that's what fascinates me, but I think that's partly what puts them in some danger with a lot of humans. I love the way you put that, that that in between us is kind of the site of danger, because in reading Raccoon, there's these two moments that I found incredibly moving, and they were like little jewels set in, in the text. There are both moments where you're quoting, uh, in one case, a poem, in one case, a story that brought out really that, that just moment of of like where you're kind of perched between two things. Mm -hmm. um, that poem by Gary La Femina, um, The Raccoon, oh, yeah. which is amazing, uh, so beautiful. And then, of course, you also um, take us into this story by Wilson Rawls, Where the Red Fern Grows, and give the account of the ghost coon, which that might be a little bit more familiar. The poem by Gary La Femina, though, I had never seen before, and it was so beautiful. I it, I, I would read a few lines of it unless you wanted to read a few lines of it, Daniel. It's so beautiful. Well, I don't have my book. Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't gotten a copy of the book yet, oh, unfortunately. This is terrible. Okay. But I'm going to read a few lines because I yeah, think it's, it's just amazing. Um, and yes, I fed her every day. I hefted a bowl of sweet cereal, left it beside the door, and watched through a window as she ate the red, green, and yellow rings. I carried that bowl out despite complaining neighbors, despite even the continuation of raids against my trash. I carried that bowl in my supplicant's fingers like a present or an offering for benevolence. I carried it forward as if it were sacred. Uh, that just was such a remarkable moment, I thought. The yeah. protesting neighbors, but also that offering. I, when I read that, poem the first time it it really it did something very different from a lot of the work that was written around raccoons it really saw them as beautiful and also the the narrator is connecting it to their own history of being hungry um and and suffering want and you know the the neighbors they think this animal is diseased they think it might have rabies they you know they're so Vermin, uh, right exactly and the the narrator is no this is this is a creature who matters well it's about being people right absolutely absolutely and it, it's such a beautiful poem mm. So I said already I love encyclopedism and encyclopedias and uh, medieval encyclopedias in particular, but all encyclopedias. This is one of those weird little children who would sit on the floor and read volumes of the encyclopedia, right? And so, of course, needless to say, I went to go look up in one of my favorite medieval encyclopedias, um, Bartholomew's Anglicus De Proprietatibus Rerum, so on the, on the properties of things, to see what he had to say about the badger. Because needless to say, you wouldn't have the raccoon. And it was wonderful description of the Badger Lodge. I don't know. Have you run across that text before? Um, I'm trying to think. Is this where they help drag each other out? Well, this there's because there's it, there's different versions and different kinds of encyclopedias. This is one where it talks about how um, they'll hibernate in the winter. They sleep through the winter. And when the cold weather comes, the male gets worried that the store of food might get too small. And he tries to hold the female badger back and take her meat away oh. and he doesn't let her eat her fill do you know this one no i don't this is okay. fascinating i'll send it to you anyway, so she she pretends as if she's following the male's will but then she comes in at the other side of the den and opens her jaw and eats and devours and wastes the meat that's been gathered there the male all unwitting so 
there's that kind of male-female competition. And then also these beasts hate the fox and often fight with him. But when the fox sees that he cannot, because of the roughness and hardness of the skin, grieve him, the, the badger, he feigns as though he were sick and overcome and flees away. And when the badger goes out and gets his prey, the fox comes into his den and befouls his chamber with urine and other uncleanness. Yeah. And the badger is squamous, is um, squeamish of such foul things and forsakes his house that's so defiled and gets another dwelling place that's amazing yeah that's the that was just like paraphrasing the middle english version but it was i mean it was i guess what it was chiming to me was i'm so familiar with the encyclopedic mode where there's these hierarchies and i get a lot of pleasure out of these hierarchies they're so orderly they're so beautiful but you in the books give us the encyclopedic but in a way that really resists and and goes outside of those structures and i guess the pleasure was double for me because of that oh fantastic thank you well i, I love taxonomies too i love categorizing things. And yet, I also, you know, in my work in indigenous studies, um, you know, so so often those taxonomies have not been to our advantage. They've been to the advantage of people who wanted to subjugate us. And so I think, you know, the the arbitrariness of taxonomy fascinates me. The uses and abuses of taxonomy really fascinates me. And just thinking about you know, so much of how we think about animals in terms of scientific discourse is very, very much rooted in Euro-Western notions of value. But what about Mississippian taxonomies? What about, you know, Coast Salish taxonomies? Those are very different things and different understandings of the world and the roles of the various beings in it. And so I, I like to put different taxonomies into conversation and really kind of open that up. But, but we are a classifying species. That's something all, all cultures categorize based on observation based on cultural values based on geography and climate you know all these different things impact how we categorize things um, but some categories have been enforced and expanded as a result of a lot of violence and a lot of animals have died as a result of these taxonomic processes as well and so i think when you're working on these animal projects thinking about how taxonomy both illuminates and obscures and sometimes actually contributes to a lot of pain and suffering. That That's really fascinating to me, but I think it's also part of the job we have is to trouble the categories, even though we understand that categorization is is a really important part of the human experience. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, one question that you didn't answer in a funny kind of way is why raccoons? Like, in other words, the badger book, I, I, you make oh. it clear how it's, how it's free. But, for, but where did raccoon come from? So when I was working on badger, um, a lot of the sources I was looking at, raccoons would just kind of pop up in strange places. And I kind of got it in my head I wanted to do another book, and I kind of wanted to work on raccoons. And I mentioned this to my husband, who said, oh, please don't ruin another animal for me. <laughs> not because he did not support me, but because I was so obsessive about badgers. I have to he, – he's super supportive. He's very, very loving. Um, I – I was a bit much when it came to badgers. I, you know, five years of badger stuff was probably enough. And so I was like, okay, you know, I, I get that. I can, I can kind of understand. He's like, no, do what you want. But that was just a lot. That's five years of badgers was a lot. Um, and so a friend of mine who did the, the book um, Beaver in the series, um, Rachel Poliquin and I uh, worked with some other folks here at UBC to put together a festival kind of uh, an event celebrating the series and we invited a bunch of writers from the series so we had we had about 14 writers i guess and um it was just such a delightful few days um, just to celebrate this series this weird and wonderful series that we love and that like bunch of nerds it was awesome we had so much fun we let our freak flag fly it was it was great and i probably haven't enjoyed an academic experience quite so much in my career like it was just it it was just fun people were quirky and eccentric and awesome and interesting and my husband 
noticed kind of how I was I was lifted up by this. I was quite buoyant in the in the conversations, and um, at, at the end, after our kind of closing event, which was so much fun, he said, "You know what? I think you should do your raccoon book." Oh, that's sweet. Aww. And I said, "Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I already wrote the proposal. <laughs> I was just waiting for you to say yes." <laughs> Oh. And the next day, I sent it off because it was already ready to go. But I was just <laughs> waiting for him to be okay with it. Um, and I, I haven't been quite as obsessed about raccoons, so he still likes them pretty well. But <laughs> no, it's a terrific book, and and I love the way too you you how can I put it's capacious and encyclopedic, but you also talk about how that plays out in Toronto in a particular kind of way. And as somebody who lived there for like twenty four years, you know, we all have raccoon stories, right? And that was really neat to have that local feeling about it as well. No, the raccoons in my backyard certainly appreciated it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was for me. You know, what was funny, though, is, you know, I lived in, in Toronto for five years, and then I moved north um, for five years while I was at U of T. And it was at my place in rural Ontario where I really had my most significant raccoon experience, which was really surprising. We were sitting um, having dinner, and we had this... Um, bird feeder that was strung between two trees it was on a single wire strung between two trees and you kind of pop the top to pour the bird seed in and it kept being knocked over and we could not understand because it was high it was about six feet high in the air we could not figure out what was knocking it over because the lid was quite heavy we thought well maybe the deer are kind of getting up and pawing at it or something and so one night we were sitting down it was early evening but we were having dinner a little later than we usually did and we were just sitting there watching and we noticed that there was this mother raccoon kind of walking over toward the trees with the bird feeder and we were just like huh interesting but you know we had a lot of wildlife and then she climbed up the tree and she gets up on on the tree and then she starts going across the wire oh, wow. flips herself upside down and like an acrobat is holding on to the wire going over on you know holding on with all four paws and then she drops herself down so she's she's hanging on by her rear paws flips down and flips the top off the bird seed and is <laughs> upside down scooping the seed into her mouth holding onto the wire from above. And we're just watching this. I got photos of it. I took pictures. <laughs> it was the most amazing act of gymnastics I had seen. Like, like we couldn't quite believe it was happening. And she was just, and she ate the whole thing. We just watched it. And we're like, wow, you know what? If you're that determined and that talented, go for it. Um, and so we kind of, we kept filling it and stuff, but it, we stopped filling it when she started bringing her babies over oh, to mm. teach them how to do it. We're like, yeah. mm, <laughs> mm, probably not. This is probably, we, we probably don't need to encourage this. Um, but that was really, for me, that was the first time I had seen that kind of ingenuity from raccoons. You know, I had kind of encountered them before in Toronto, but nothing like that. And in some ways, that's kind of where that where it started. And I was also working on the Badger book at that time, so... That uh, that interestingly leads to uh, another question, which I mentioned to some people that I was going to be talking with you about this topic today. And the question that they all had was about the intelligence of raccoons. Mm. That is the thing that seemed to jump out most to them, that raccoons are far more intelligent than we might have given credit to them originally, and that there might be some really interesting distinctions between the way that indigenous people versus colonizers would have described raccoons. And also somebody wanted to know who would win in a duel of wits, raccoon or coyote. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, good question. So I'm always a little hesitant with the intelligence question because i think so often that that presumes a human baseline and what people are actually saying is how smart are they compared to us rather than how smart are they on their own terms in their own sense world and in relation to their own environment and in that case they are they're pretty remarkable they can adapt to really radically changing circumstances quite readily. Um, you know, they are drawn toward novelty and they're drawn to know how things work. But they aren't necessarily creative thinkers. 
Part of this comes from my conversation with Suzanne McDonald, who's an animal behaviorist at York University, who's kind of the person in Canada uh, who does work on raccoons. And, and she's also uh, in a psychology department. So th these, are, these are the kinds of questions that she asks. Um, so they are very smart, but they're also, they're also just determined. And I think what we see as clever is actually just determination um, in many cases, because she's done some really remarkable uh, experiments. And sometimes they, they, they show problem-solving abilities, and sometimes they're just like, well, if I just keep hitting this enough, something's going to happen. And typically they're right, right? Well, that was the solution with the green bins, right? Like everybody thought that it was such a wily solution, but it was actually some raccoons figured out if you just bash them enough times, they'll, they'll come open. Well, and one thing that she pointed out was, because um, she was actually the person who consulted with the city on this, and, and um, she was a little bit annoyed at the way that press had taken it up um, because she said, you know, it's, it's nursing females who are more motivated to break in and they're not teaching other raccoons how to do it. So it's not like other raccoons are hanging around and going like, ooh, I'm going to do that. It's, it, it wasn't a, a, a taught practice. It was one raccoon figured out it worked, and so she just kept doing it. And so I think that, yes, they are very smart animals. They're very clever in their own ways. They know how to adapt to their own environment. There's much that they can do in that way. But I wouldn't, like, in, in a lot of ways, uh, like, chimpanzees they they teach each other differently uh, crows and ravens they actually teach their generations you know and, and have be behavioral change as a result we don't see a lot of that with raccoons um thus far in the stuff that i read um i would never put it past them i like that thus far <laughs> yeah you were i mean you were describing that mother raccoon seeming to teach her children about your feeder right yeah well but i think there's a difference in like here's a ready and available food source i'm going to show you how to get access to it and how do we break into this bin but again i i would not say that they're not intelligent at all i think they're incredibly intelligent but they are intelligent in the ways that they've needed to be just like other animals are but i think that that trainability was something that i was kind of surprised about um like ravens and crows corvids on that measure, like you don't want to piss off a crow because they will teach their kids you're an enemy, and for the rest of your life, the crows will hate your ass. And raccoons aren't necessarily the same in that way. And yet, they are changing, especially in Toronto. Um, they are kind of selecting for more adaptability. Um, and so... I would not put anything past them. In terms of who would win between a coyote and a <laughs> and a raccoon, um, again, these are two very, very shrewd animals, two very determined animals. Raccoons can get to places coyotes can't. Um, and so I think in terms of the capacity to annoy one another, the raccoon would have the advantage in that. Um, so I would, I would actually, I would say the raccoon. All right. Yeah, of, of the two. Not because I have any lack of appreciation for the intelligence of coyotes, um, but I think raccoons just have access to different kinds of habitats and territories and different kinds of experiences. Um, so I think I would, I would put my money on the raccoon. I also love annoying each other as a metric of intelligence oh, yeah. and, and who would win in a fight. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid that's about all the time we have for for today. Uh, is there any last thing you want to say before we head off? No, I really appreciate it. I just hope that um, that if folks read the books, that they just have a, a deeper appreciation for the animals and and hopefully a bit more of a of a sense of generosity toward them. Because I think, you know, for both of them, our actions have a pretty profound impact on them. And that can be for good or for ill. And I hope it's for the good. I think absolutely they would if they read these books, which they totally should. They're delightful. Oh, so <laughs> good. <laughs> so, so interesting. So diverse. So it goes into so many interesting areas. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel. 
Listeners, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes for links for anything we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 47B. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at The Spouter Inn.